Less than a decade after the guns have gone silent over the Korean peninsula, a new era of the Cold War begins. This time between the two greatest powers of the communist world, China and the Soviet Union. Frustrated by an unequal relationship is China's supreme leader, Mao Zedong. Mao's ambition to put China on the world stage would shape her transformation as a nation. But it would create an irreparable rift with the Soviet Union, one that would break out into open war. For so long, China's bitter rivalry with the Soviet Union has been shrouded in secrecy. Now, eyewitness accounts from PLA soldiers reveal a conflict that has been brewing since the beginning of the Sino-Soviet alliance. This is the untold story of Mao's Cold War with the Soviet Union. March 1969. On a tiny island in the Yusuri River between China and the Soviet Union, war has broken out. 19-year-old Wang Yanqi is about to face an enemy once considered China's closest ally. My name is Wang Yanqi. I'm 62 years old. In 1969, on August 6th, 我离开了大连，就直接来到了牡丹江，呃，在二十三军六十七师二零一团新兵连。哎呀，整个船团这次群情激愤，要我们执行公用任务，执行什么任务呢？我们不知道，但是我们大家纷纷猜测，可能要上
But Mao's thirst for Soviet technology had its roots 20 years earlier, in 1949, when China and the Soviet Union were still allies. October 1949. The newly established People's Republic of China looks to the Soviet Union to help transform it into a world power. In 1949, when PRC was founded, China was extremely weak, very poor, and the Soviet Union was in a much better shape in terms of industrial development, economic development, military capability, and political influence in the world. Three months later, in 1950, the Russian leader signs a treaty of friendship. Secretary General Joseph Stalin. The terms of the treaty, however, would be tilted against China's favor. This plants the seeds of mistrust. Almost all of the Soviet's loans under the treaty would be for the purchase of Soviet arms. In addition, the treaty gives the Soviets exclusive access to Xinjiang's and Manchuria's economies. Mao finds China caught in an unequal relationship. So from the beginning of the establishment of the PRC, Stalin is making the point that uh, you're the junior partner, emphasize junior. And Mao is immediately beginning to calculate the potential repercussions of this. And there is, he's conflicted there. I mean, on the one hand, yes, I need what the Soviets can provide, and I genuinely admire Stalin. On the other hand, you can't treat us like this. We're China, and we may have been down, but we're not going to be soon. Soon after signing the Sino-Soviet Treaty, Mao finds a chance to gain his edge over Stalin. Later the same year, in June 1950, War breaks out in Korea between the Soviet-backed North and American-backed South. Unwilling to risk a direct confrontation with the US, Stalin requests for Mao to intervene. Mao decides to play the situation to China's advantage. He demands that Stalin provide military aid as well as air cover for his troops. He hopes this war will be an equal partnership Four months later, in 1950, Stalin agrees to send military equipment to China. But he insists that China take the lead in the fighting. Mao直到毛泽东决定中国出兵单独和美国作战。这个斯大林呢，他不知道中国是真的是假的。哎，他说你你先去，啊，你打两个月、两个半月，我再上。就在这种情况下，毛咬着牙行，我先去。With an uneasy compromise reached, Mao orders over 250,000 troops into Korea. Stalin deploys airplanes to China's northeast to defend her coastal regions. But Stalin stops short. He decides not to send planes to Korea. Mao's outgunned army faces the UN war machine alone. Clearly, um, the Chinese leaders were disappointed you know, by the Soviet decision. And it was one of the arguments that Mao expressed later on with the Soviet leaders that Moscow simply betrayed China. 
As a stalemate sets in over Korea, Mao pressures Stalin for aid to develop China's own military capabilities. Stalin agrees to send more ammunition, but holds off on the transfer of military technology. Stalin and Mao's rivalry hits a deadlock, but events would soon take an unexpected turn. The 5th of March, 1953. China is embroiled in the Korean War. But a shocking event turns the course of the war. Soviet leader Joseph Stalin dies from a cerebral hemorrhage. The new Soviet leadership urges Mao to end the Korean War. Within months, a ceasefire is called. But the experience of the Korean War casts a shadow over Sino-Soviet relations. The Soviet's failure to deliver many of its promises of military support during the war convinces Mao that China has to become self-sufficient. Later that year, Mao unleashes a five-year plan to increase China's industrial output. He is determined to transform China into a power no one, not even the Soviet Union, can afford to ignore. Now Stalin was gone, there was no need for Mao to be fearful of the Soviet Union. And it sort of really lifted the cover of many other factors. When Stalin was alive, Mao couldn't reveal his personal political ambitions. But now uh, there is no, you know, reservation or hesitation for Mao to compete for political influence in the socialist world. When Stalin was alive, Mao had to yield to his reputation and authority. But now Mao sees the chance to dominate Stalin's successor, Premier Nikita Khrushchev. One year later, in 1954, Khrushchev visits Beijing for the fifth anniversary of the People's Republic of China. He offers many gifts to the young nation, including loans that Mao is hungry for. Khrushchev even agrees to return Soviet bases in Port Arthur to China, a major sticking point of the Sino-Soviet relations since 1950. Chi 2 years later in 1956 Khrushchev does the unforgivable At the Soviet Union's 20th Party Congress he denounces Stalin's personality cult and excesses Khrushchev's move is unprecedented the rule of Stalin has never been questioned not even by Mao in the minds of a lot of Chinese leaders, including Mao, Stalin was a godlike political figure. Even though Mao had a lot of you know, unpleasant relationship with Stalin during Mao's revolution. Mao himself, as we know, became Stalin in China. He enjoyed personality cult 
absolute control and political power. Now, in 1956-57, when Khrushchev said Stalin was wrong, Mao could not accept. So Mao began to criticize Khrushchev, call him revisionist, new Russian imperialist leader, betraying the communist movement. To make matters worse, Khrushchev puts forward his concept of peaceful coexistence with the West. He believes that capitalism will fall apart from its own excesses. But Mao believes de-Stalinization will bring down the communist world, dragging China down with it. You are telling the Western world that the communist system had flaws. Before that, you know, in the Cold War between the West and the East, there was contention, there was rivalry for you know, the merits of political system. So De-Stalinization led to the effect that it weakens the social world's legitimacy and the moral, political you know, sense of superiority. So Mao was worried about that. Within months, Mao sends a veiled challenge to Khrushchev. He declares that Stalin's serious mistake was not to treat the Chinese as equals. But he maintains that Stalin, without doubt, was a good Marxist. By implying that Khrushchev's denunciations of Stalin were brash, Mao subtly positions himself as Khrushchev's superior. But Mao's ambitions would soon result in serious consequences for China. He begins drastic measures to overtake the Soviet Union in what would terrifyingly become known as the Great Leap Forward. In 1958, Mao unleashes the Great Leap Forward an ambitious project to transform China into a modern state through rapid industrialization. It's fueled by a drive to rid China of its dependency on the Soviet Union. A Soviet Union that Mao thinks is distancing itself too far from its communist roots. The main concern is but with masses of labor diverted to steel production, there aren't enough people to farm the land. With no food, severe famines spread across China over the next three years. It is catastrophic. A combination of famine and overwork kill 38 million people. A death toll unprecedented in history. The Great Leap Forward was not a rational you know, decision making. It was not based on, you know, expertise. It was simply a political decision and uh, very emotional sort of decision making. Instead of claiming responsibility, Mao officially names the period the three years of natural disasters and blames the famine on unfair Soviet policies. The perception of the Soviet blame for the famine still lives on today. Veteran Gao Xingchen grew up during the Great Leap Forward. I 
。我小的时候呢，啊，苹果捞不到吃啊。我们大连地区是出水果的呀，却吃不到苹果，而且呢，只过年过节能吃到。听说大部分的水果都要还债了，还给苏联还债。我们粮食供应啊，是供应不上来。When Khrushchev hears of the devastation, he openly challenges Mao. Khrushchev and other Soviet leaders, they thought Mao was crazy. Uh, it's, it's completely unrealistic, completely ut utopian. So you are destroying your own society and, and the country. So Mao was very angry when he came to know those kind of Soviet perspective of his approach to, to communism. One year later, in 1960, Mao bites back at the Romanian Party Congress. In front of the communist world, Mao denounces Khrushchev as a revisionist. Khrushchev retaliates by withdrawing all Soviet experts and aid from China. The Sino-Soviet fallout is now in the open. Two years later, in 1962, the ideological rift worsens. A crisis in Cuba involving the Soviets erupts. The Soviets have been secretly building nuclear missile bases in Cuba. The US responds with a naval blockade of the island. The crisis quickly escalates, throwing the world to the brink of nuclear war. In a rare gesture, China offers full support for the Soviet Union. But for Mao, Khrushchev does the unthinkable. He reaches a compromise with US President John F. Kennedy and agrees to dismantle missile bases in Cuba. Mao condemns Khrushchev for what he terms cowardice in the Caribbean. Khrushchev retaliates by severing all ties with China. He also condemns China's nuclear arms program. The breakdown in Sino-Soviet alliance is now complete. Two years later, in 1964, the Sino-Soviet split takes an unexpected twist. Khrushchev's own protégés oust him from power. The new supreme leader of the Soviet Union, Secretary General Leonid Brezhnev. Mao sends a delegation to Moscow in 1965 in the hope of reviving the Sino-Soviet alliance. But the Chinese delegation get a rude shock at the Soviet reception. Malinov斯基他是个国防部长，哎，呃，原来苏联远东军的司令。这小子就喝多了，他跟贺龙说，中苏关系本来是很好的，啊，我们就像亲兄弟一样。后来就是毛泽东跟贺龙晓夫他们
The year is 1966. Using the excuse the Soviets are attempting to sow discord in China, Mao unleashes the Cultural Revolution. It's a terrifying campaign to purge his enemies at all levels of society. Mao begins targeting the top ranks of the Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army. He denounces his enemies as Soviet revisionists. Veteran Gao Sing Chen bears witness to the turmoil. The fervor of the Cultural Revolution further escalates the Sino-Soviet conflict. It brings all of China's misgivings over its unfair relationship with the Soviets to crisis point. The long-standing offense, one and a half million square kilometers of land that Tsarist Russia had taken from China in the 19th century. This territorial issue becomes a nationalistic flashpoint. The more intense the Cultural Revolution became, the more superheated the rhetoric became about the century of humiliation. And while Taiwan was the number one unredeemed issue, right behind it was the northern border, and that was the Soviet Union. So you have the old friction with Russia now being grafted onto the new, quite intense friction with the Soviet Union. Uh, a dangerous overheating of that relationship. Thousands of Chinese besiege the Soviet embassy in Beijing. Groups even gather along China's border with the Soviet Union to shout insults at Soviet guards. The Cultural Revolution convinces Soviet leader Brezhnev China must be contained. Brezhnev deploys one million troops to the country's shared borders. China retaliates by doing the same. It is the most dramatic turn in state-to-state -state relations in the Cold War. Professor Li Xiaobin served in the army during the time. He remembers the sudden hostility. We had morning drills practice. We used the Americans as our shooting target. We paint the target as a Nixon, you know, big nose, black, blue eyes because we were told Americans coming, we need to prepare the war against America. All of a sudden, we don't know why, we were told Americans not coming, but the Russians well. So we had to change the shooting target, you know, not Nixon, but Brezhnev, Russians coming. So we began to prepare war against the Soviet Union. With increased patrols on both sides, conflicts break out. These are the archives Chinese officials release. They show Soviet troops harassing Chinese guards at the border. Chinese media also reports a Soviet tank running over Chinese protesters. Chinese fishermen are also harassed. But historical records reveal both sides committed offenses. With tensions running at an all-time high, it will only take one misstep for both sides to break out into a full-scale war. The 2nd of March, 1969. One of the most tense points along the border is a small island less than two and a half kilometers long. Jernbao Island is situated in the Yusuri River to the east of Heilongjiang province. It sits within hundreds of meters of both Soviet and Chinese military camps. 
Western and Soviet scholars say that under Mao's explicit orders, Chinese soldiers ambush Soviet border guards here. The Soviets say over 60 of their soldiers are killed. But China's official tone is that the Soviets opened fire first. Fearing a full-scale war, Mao sends more soldiers to Jernbao. Wang Lianqi is one of thousands who receive Mao's order. Uh One week later, on the 15th of March, 1969, the Soviet Union launches a full-scale attack. They bombard the island with heavy artillery. Spearheading their land assault is a devastating weapon. The T-62 battle tank, a weapon that has never been in Chinese hands. For the PLA veterans, it was an impossible fight against the overwhelming Soviet war machine. Zhang 炮火最激烈的一天是但有点确实在前面爆炸的时候 in a huge moral victory, the Chinese army managed to capture one Soviet T-62 tank. They are ordered to protect it at all cost. But the Soviets launch an all-out attack to recapture their tank resulting in devastating consequences. Barely two days after their first offensive, the Soviet Union launches another attack. Their goal this time, the sophisticated T-62 tank that is now in Chinese hands. Gaoxing Chen is tasked to protect China's war prize at all costs. Heilung 
the Soviets failed to recapture the tank. But their missiles hit other targets with devastating results. More than 800 Chinese are killed as the Soviets relentlessly bombard Zhenbao for months. Their missiles even reach 20 kilometers into China as the Soviets try to wrestle Zhenbao from Chinese control. For veteran Wang Lianqi, the front line remains fraught with danger. Zhenbao的战争状态并没有结束 As stalemate sets in over Zhenbao Island, another flashpoint develops. This time on a part along the Sino-Soviet border, more than 6,000 kilometers away, at the border zone of Tie Le Kirti along Xinjiang province. August the 13th, 1969. Chinese frontier troops patrol Tie Le Kirti. A Soviet task force responds with deadly force. They kill the entire patrol and occupy the Chinese border zone. The Soviets are further hardening their attitude towards China. As the border war stretches into months, Soviet leader Brezhnev considers a drastic measure to end the Chinese threat. A nuclear strike. The threat of nuclear war now hangs heavily over China. The Soviets' nuclear capability far exceeds China's. In Beijing, Mao orders the construction of an underground bunker city against a nuclear fallout. Professor Shen is a 19-year-old soldier in the army at the time. He remembers the tension in Beijing. Jichu Thousands of Chinese build a labyrinth of bomb shelters, stretching almost entirely under the capital city. China's Cold War with the Soviet Union now reaches crisis point. As the Soviets consider carrying out a nuclear strike on China to end a border war, they receive a dire warning. US President Richard Nixon threatens retaliation if the Soviets carry out a nuclear attack. Nixon states that such an attack will be a declaration of World War III.
His hardline approach dashes Moscow's plans for a decisive strike against China. More importantly, it changes the game entirely, bringing the Cold War into a new era. So now the game changed. The game of the Cold War changed from a two poles, a bipolar system to a triangle system. Now Nixon introduced new player, China, to the Cold War. So there was a triangle, three poles, China, United States, and the Soviet Union. When the US threatens to retaliate against a nuclear attack on China, the Soviet Union is forced to assess its strategy. The 11th of September, 1969, Soviet Prime Minister Alexei Kosygin meets his Chinese counterpart, Zhao Enlai, to defuse the conflict. With the frosty relations, the two meet only at Beijing airport. They agree to begin border negotiations. By the next year, hostilities cease along the Sino-Soviet border due to the negotiations. But it would take nearly 20 years before both sides find a settlement to the border issue. On the 9th of September, 1976, Mao dies, ending nearly 27 years of his total rule over China. A huge shift in relations occurs inside and outside China. His legacy, however, is immortal. Since the beginning of Sino-Soviet relations, Mao's ambitions for China set the alliance on a dangerous path. <laughs> 